So a, a couple things, I guess, come up, uh, come to mind before I get back into the full flow of the of the content. I just was just a question came up moments ago about about when you're drinking coffee and you and you pull the top off the coffee cup. And you, in fact, we can discuss the top and you blow on your coffee. Is that like windshield? Does it get colder and stuff like that? Uh, because because I, I, I talked last time. So before I answer that exactly, I talked last time about uh, when you're trying to stay warm in a cold in, in the midst of cold air, or you're trying to stay cool in the midst of warm air. One of the things that helps you do that is that you tend to to accumulate a layer of air near your skin, held in place in part by viscous forces and viscous drag that you have brought to the temperature of your skin, more or less, and that's insulating. So it's nice to have that layer there. If, you're, if it's windy, though, and that layer is blown away, you have to rewarm or recool the air. It, if it's cold, it feels colder, wind chill. If, it, if it's warm, it feels warmer, and that would be, I don't know, hot air blast. So, so um, much of, of the issue of clothing and, and certain amounts of like jackets and windbreakers and stuff like that, are, their purpose is just to help keep that layer in place. Uh, this is particularly noticeable when you're swimming and you're swimming in cold water. Uh, that layer of, of warmed water near your skin tends to stay there, keeps you, keeps you warmer. You know, from, I hope from experience, that if, you're, if you remain motionless in cold water, you're, you're better off than if you start thrashing around because you knock that layer off yourself. And so uh, wetsuits and dry suits, and wetsuits in particular, when a wetsuit, it, it doesn't keep you dry, it just traps the layer of water near your skin so it doesn't, uh, you, you can't be blown away. So you're, you're actually being insulated by water itself, which is not a wonderful conductor of heat either. It's better than air, but it's not, it's not wonderful. Is that okay with everybody so far? So, Next degree of complexity is what, what happens when you blow across the top of your cup of coffee or chocolate or tea or whatever, and it, it, it was super hot, and you, and you take a sip, ah, it burns your mouth, then you blow on it, and suddenly it's, it's drinkable. What have you done? What you've done is you've blown away a layer of air that was at the surface that was chock full of moisture. The water, the Water exposed to room air will evaporate hot, hot boiling near boiling water will evaporate evaporate kind of like crazy. Water molecules are taking off rapidly, and they're rarely getting replaced by a water molecule landing because it's room air. It's not so full of water molecules. But in this trapped environment, right there on the top of the cup and stuff, with the, particularly with the lid on, the moisture can accumulate, and so the water molecules that left a minute ago are still there in the gas now rattling around in there and had the, every opportunity to land back on the on the hot beverage and basically evaporation is being suppressed the water is trying to evaporate but the landing rate of of water molecules in that dense moist air above the above the beverage is replacing them too fast so they're not evaporating fast is that okay with people questions so so basically, that it's the, the relative humidity in your cup goes nearly to, z nearly, yeah, nearly to 100%. Nothing gets away, and, and the evaporation is seriously suppressed. And that actually is the value of the, of the plastic cap on your cup. It's, it's not a whole lot of insulation. And you know, it, it, OK, it, it does prevent convection in some extent. But mainly, it's keeping the water molecules trapped in there so they can't get away. Because evaporative cooling, particularly from water, from very hot water, is just very effective at sucking heat out of something. So as soon as you pull the cap off and start, start letting air get in there and replacing this dense, moist water vapor, evaporation kicks into high gear and you cool off the, the, the drink really fast. You don't have to evaporate very much of the water from a cup of coffee. If you evaporate like the top millimeter of water on that coffee, you'll cool the whole thing down by, by, by tens of degrees. The energy it takes to evaporate a little bit of water is enormous. And so it just sucks all the energy out of the out of the hot drink and cools it off. Is that okay? All right. So what what I wanted to do at the uh, I, I I finished most of what I want to say about clothing insulation and climate, but it, just more the more I think about 
the future. I feel a little bit like I'm rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic here talking about greenhouse gases. Um, whatever. Uh, it, in fact, it, it, it's, it, it has become, <laughs> in recent days, significantly more likely that efforts to try to control and curb greenhouse gases will, uh, will be diminished and that, that environmental protections in general will be greatly diminished. So I wanted to say a few things about this. Um, before talking about greenhouse gases, uh, how many of you ever heard of Love Canal? Has anybody heard of Love Canal? You know, it was a big deal when I was a kid, approximately. Love Canal, just, it, it, it's got physics in it, it, it indirectly. Uh, it's more for, the, for, for uh, Physics 1060, which has electricity power generation. Uh, in the late 1800s, um, near Niagara Falls, I mean, people, were, Edison and uh, others were trying to electrify the country, uh, not, not by elections, but rather by uh, trying to run electricity around. And so uh, there was, a, there was a, a battle between direct current and alternating current, which is a long story that I won't get into so much, but but uh, around Niagara Falls, there was interest in using hydroelectric power locally to, 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 to make prosperous industries and such. such. And, a, and a guy whose last name was Love uh, started digging canals, to, in part to try to move water around for hydroelectric power, and then ultimately over, it was a shipping channel. And what, anyhow, it, it, the, cha the, the canal was dug to a, a large extent, but it was never used for anything. And uh, a chemical company, uh, popped up in its vicinity and was looking at it going like, hmm, big basin into which to pour everything we don't want anymore. And so they, they over, over many years, filled it with, with w quite a soup of stuff you don't want get, to get near. And subsequently, it was covered over, and I think it became uh, uh, it, it, uh, neighborhoods sprung up in this area on this ground, and there were serious illness problems associated with that. It was just a disaster. And so that was one of the great Superfund sites, which is also something you, you don't even think about anymore. But the long and short of it then is that they're just dumping stuff out into the great wide world, uh, chemicals in particular, has been in our past and, and has led to incredible trouble. Uh, it's sure convenient to be able to do that stuff. I hope it doesn't come back. Uh, it's possible it'll come back. You know, it's, Sure, it, it, you know, being able to just turn on the faucet and pour the stuff down the drain is great, uh, somewhat. Okay, so that's just my random harangue. The more important harangue here is I want to make sure that you guys understand why putting dark in the infrared molecules into the Earth's atmosphere increases the temperature, the average temperature at the surface. Just to remind you what the story was, most. The, 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 the simplest of the molecules in the Earth's atmosphere are not dark in the infrared, meaning they're, they're, they're transparent in the infrared. They're not black in the infrared. It's, it's hard for you to sort of think of, of a gas being, being black. Uh, it, as another aside, there was a time when, when people wanted to, television people wanted to know, could I, could I make a gas that was colorful to, to use in a demonstration? And I went looking, and I, and I could not find a single gas that you can see that is not toxic. So if you can see the gas with invisible light, if it's orange and stuff, I filled my basement, at, at, as a kid, I filled my basement two times with nitrogen dioxide, which is a, is a lovely orange. <laughs> quite, quite, quite dark, too, you know, and quite toxic. <laughs> I opened all the windows and left. Um, so there are no, uh, to my knowledge, there are no gases you can see that are, that are safe to be around. Yeah? How did I do that? Uh, nitric acid, which I had, you could use. You used to be able to get chemicals, I mean, along with Love Canal and stuff like that. You used to be able to order any chemical you liked, <laughs> and I did. My father had a handbook of physics and chemistry. This is when I was in in, in sixth grade, um, that had a section on dangerous chemicals, and and I ordered every one that wasn't toxic. I mean, it, hazardous because it's toxic is really boring, but hazardous because it's like whoa, it bursts into flames in contact with anything organic. Um, that, that actually, chromium trioxide also would be described as hexavalent chromium, as in Brockovich, the hexavalent chromium stuff. Yeah, I had that. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it burst into flames in contact with anything that was organic. It was great. Um, yeah, so I had all that stuff. And, and so nitric acid, uh, tri 
nitric acid, when, you, when the reactions get out of hand, uh, it, it, it just starts turning out all kinds of nitrogen dioxide. <laughs> it's coming out, of the, coming out of the sink like, oh my gosh, hit the road. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah, I had, I had uh, yeah, people my, my, my generation who, who play with chemistry as kids, you had to work at it to get those ones. I mean, all the, all the, the, the strong acids, nitric, sulfuric, hydrochloric, um, all the, was the good os oxidizing agents, trying to blow stuff up or whatever, successfully on occasion. <laughs> so so uh, visible gases, um, you know, stay away from them. But in the infrared, there are lots of, there are lots of gases that are, that are colorful, not to our eyes, but to, to a camera who could see them, uh, that are not toxic. Carbon dioxide's one, water's one. Um, most of the complex molecules, the simplest of them aren't, nitrogen and oxygen not, but, but the others are. And they have, they have spectra, which is to say that because of quantum mechanics and, and, and things that I talk about in 1060, they interact primarily with, with certain wavelengths of light and not others. So they, they have their own specificity. In fact, you can identify them by their infrared absorption, and that's common in chemistry. You know, what do we have here? Well, let's look at its infrared spectrum. It's so, it's such and such. Well, if you sprinkle them all out in the Earth's atmosphere, it becomes darker and darker in the infrared. It, it, instead of being transparent, which means it's an emissivity of zero, it's got an emissivity of, it, it's, it's spotty, but it's got some ones in it, basically, along the spectrum. And so we're darkening the Earth's atmosphere as we put more of this stuff out there. And consequently, the Earth gets better at, the Earth's atmosphere gets better at radiating thermal radiation out into space. And as I, I think described last time, and I won't go into great detail, but the detail about it again is, is there is an effective surface that is not at the Earth's surface, but is above the Earth's surface, from which the Earth's thermal radiation originates. It's, not, it's an averaging thing. There are, actually, there are many ways of describing why, why the temperature of the Earth goes up as a result of doing, putting this gas out. So this, this one I find particularly straightforward, so it's my favorite. So, so if you can imagine it, at about five kilometers up there, there is a it black in the infrared skin on the Earth's atmosphere from which its, its thermal radiation originates. That, it's, that's averaged over, you know, some of it actually originates from the Earth, the surface, some of it's way up higher, it's all over the place. But on average, five kilometers up. Well, that, that temperature to match the, the sun's input of thermal energy to the Earth, the temperature of that black surface up there has to be minus 18 degrees Celsius. So that's, that, that fixes the temperature at the, at the radiation surface. But down here, five kilometers down, it's hotter. And it's hotter not because of in radiative heat transfer stuff, but just because atmospheres on planets develop thermal gradients. And it comes about just from the simple physics of raising and lower, ga lowering gases and, and letting them expand and contract. And we'll do that today. We'll I'll show you that as you, as you compress a gas, it heats up. As you expand a gas, it cools down. So. Uh, the result is that it's maybe 18, minus 18 up there at five kilometers, but as you come down deeper, five kilometers, as you work your way five kilometers down to, the, to where we live, the temperature rises. It rises steadily at about 6.6 .6 Celsius, degrees Celsius per kilometer. And by the time you get down here, the temperature has risen to about 15 Celsius on average. That's, a, that's, a, that's over the whole year, over the whole globe, about 15 degrees. And as we push that radiating surface outward by darkening the atmosphere in the infrared, that there's a longer distance to travel from the surface to the Earth's physical surface, and therefore more opportunity for the temperature to rise. So by the time you get down here, it's no longer 15C. It's more, it gets getting more toward the approaching 16C. And it will keep on going up. And the more crud we put in the air, the, the, the higher the farther out that radiating surface, effective radiating surface will go, and the hotter it'll be down here. So that's one, you know, that, that's that. Consequences, among them, it just gets hotter on average. Uh, the other one is, as you heat up, I told you the heating up the water, not only do you melt ice into water, which is the topic we've just done, so you turn the ice caps less and less into ice and more and more into water, but you also warm the liquid water in the, in the oceanic basins, which it causes it to expand. So it, it takes more volume. It, it's got more volume. There's sort of, you're making more water. It's got to go somewhere. So up it comes, and it will gradually uh, absorb 
ocean, your beachfront property will suddenly become uh, underwater underwater property. Come and visit my to see my house. Um, you know, bring bring your scuba equipment. Uh, what what else? Oh, as we'll see shortly, be, uh, beyond air conditioning, which is the topic I'm about to hit, uh, we'll go to uh, automobiles, which are a type of heat engine. It turns out if you've got a hot thing and a cold thing, it's all thermal energy. You've got, you've, got hot, you've got thermal energy in a hot object, thermal energy in a cold object. By letting that thermal energy go from the hot object to the cold object, that process allows you to divert some of the thermal energy and turn it into work, actually make something useful out of it. That's how a car runs. That's how many things run. That's how the winds run. And you know, what powers the winds? It's all thermal energy. But in going from a hot place, it's heated by the sun typically, to a cold place not so heated by the sun, that unbalance, imbalance of temperatures allows wor some work to be done and drives the winds. And the bigger those temperature differences, the more powerful the winds can get. And so what's powering hurricanes and tornadoes and all these major storms is temperature differences. And the bigger those temperature differences become, the more uh, work not very useful work, destructive work the storms can do. So, so uh, that, this is why the, the, the term global warming has become more like climate change. We're, we're anticipating more and more uh, ferocious storms as time goes on. I mean, it's all on average, it's statistical, but uh, that's the basis of it. Questions? Okay, with that in mind, last thing I want to do is I want to make sure that you have a sense for you know, what can you do about this. L you know, lots of little things. This, this is shifting the deck chairs around. But, but uh, insulation is important in your houses. So when you, when you get around to doing deal with houses, um, as we'll see, air conditioning becomes more difficult as the temperature difference between outside and inside becomes larger. So for one thing, you don't want to over, uh, over air condition your house if you can avoid it. The other thing is you want to insulate your house as well as possible because everything you're doing and trying to make the inside cold, the outside hot uh, is undone by leaks. If you're, losing, if you're leaking heat, it's going to leak into your air conditioned house from the hot outside and spoil the air conditioning. So insulate well. And one of the pieces of, insula of, of insulation that I didn't mention yet, and I'm bringing it out here just to mention, is your windows. I talked about the insulating your walls is, is pretty straightforward. You need to allocate a certain thickness of the walls for insulation, and more than, you, more than you'd like, it's going to consume some of the size of your house is, is, is insulation, walls and ceilings particularly. But that you can use nice fibrous stuff that's, that you don't care what it looks like because you don't see it it's hidden in the wall. Windows not so much. You can't put fiber in the middle of the window because then you can't see through it. So how do you make a window that's nice and insulating? Well, the, the, the best insulation that you can do really is something that's like this. This is a double walled. I mean, you've seen this guy before. It is a glass, it was blown as a, blown at a glass bubble, and then it the, the top was turned inside out into the, into the uh, bottom of the bubble. So it's double walled. It's a thermos bottle. It's really, it's known as a Dewar flask after James Dewar, who invented these things, or at least uh, used them early on. It's double walled with nothing in between the walls, as in a vacuum. A vacuum, no gas, nothing, can't conduct heat because there's nothing to conduct. Uh, it can't convect because there's nothing to convect. It's really great insulation. The one thing remaining, and so, so you can do stuff, like you can pour something that's 300 degrees below zero Fahrenheit into the middle, and after it's cooled down the glass, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, well set here. Uh, also, it's because the cold is at the bottom, it's like putting the hot at the, at the top. The, when, you, when you heat the top of something, the, the local air is heated, expands, and stays up at the top. Here, the local air is cooled, can, uh, becomes more dense, and is stuck. So cold, cold, putting a cold object at the bottom of a, of a container is, uh, prevents convection. This is why you know, deep freezes, or you go to the, air, go to the supermarket, and they have, the, they have the, the frozen food sitting there in, a, in an open container, an open freezer. You think, wow, isn't that leaking heat like crazy? Well, not so much, because it's cold there. That air is dense. It stays, it stays in pl place. 
unless you blow it away. So here, cold air is here, staying in place. It's not, it doesn't have any tendency to rise unless I force it to. Okay. So heat is trying to get into that super cold liquid. Uh, it, it comes in a little bit by conduction, by radiation at the surface here. But the walls don't carry much heat into, the, into there. Um, one thing that is missing on this Dewar flask that for the purposes of demonstrations, it is clear. But on a more sophisticated Dewar flask or more, com more complete Dewar flask, the inside surfaces of those pieces of glass would be silvered. They would be mirror-like, shiny. So they can't exchange heat by radiation. Okay? So thermos bottles, you know, in my childhood thermos bottles were glass bottles like this, vacuum, silvered inside, and I invariably broke them. I don't know about, you, you guys are past that era. They're, they're oh God, they broke. You know, you hear, you hear you go, the lunchbox, oh no, <laughs> the hot chocolate is now, it's gone. Yeah, yeah you know, it's really a hot toddy. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, I'm his teacher. You know, um, in any case, it would, so so mirror was important. So 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 the the in this building there are lots of such containers that have mirrored surfaces on the inside. It's very hard for heat to make it through the walls. No air, so there's no conduction, no convection, and even the radiation is really driven way down to almost nothing. So the heat just doesn't get in there. So okay, so far. So how about windows? Windows, ideally you would have. Okay, first off, single pane windows. Forget them. That's just a piece of glass. It's not, a, it's not a good conductor of heat, but it's not bad either. And therefore, if you try to put cold outside air on one side of the plate of, of single plate of glass and uh, warm indoor air on the other side, there's going to be a lot of heat flowing through that window. It's not going to be great. So there are houses certainly that still have that. You know, old ones, uh, of course, uh, still have them around. What do you do? Well, a, a solution is to add a second pane of glass. And so some, some of you all may be, uh, be sticking like sheets of plastic over your windows as it gets cold to add the second layer. And what you're, what you're trying to do is reproduce what actually sold commercially is, 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 is two or three plate glass. So when you buy modern, glass, modern windows, they, they all, virtually all of them then, have at least two plates of glass, maybe a third. I'm not going to worry about the third. It's just a, a nuance on, this, on the two. Two plates of glass. What do you do with those two plates? One of them's going to be outside. One of them's going to be inside. So, so their, their actual temperatures are going to be quite different, those two plates of glass. One of them's going to be cold, like the outdoor air during the winter, say. And one of them's going to be hot, like the indoor air during the winter. And it's going to be reversed during the summer. What, you, what, what the window's job is to do is, is to not let heat flow from one plate of glass to the other. How does it do that? Well, ideally, it would put vacuum in, in between the glasses, but that's unrealistic because if there's no pressure inside, there's atmospheric pressure outside, it's going to crush the windows. So the windows can't tolerate that, that pressure imbalance. So they have to put a gas in between for anything realistic. What they can do is they can put in a gas that is not a good conductor of heat. Air's pretty, pretty bad already, but they can do better. They can put in argon, and they often do. This is actually the case in which they... they for a television show where we were showing how they were making glass windows, we wanted to put in color. Be, wouldn't it be nice to be able to fill it with colorful gas? No, actually not. It's all toxic. So they actually put argon frequently into those windows. They do not want moisture in there because the moisture is going to do s strange things. Among them, condense on the cold surface and cloud it up. So they want it dry, nothing condensable, nothing that becomes a liquid. And they wanted a poor conductor of heat. So argon is, is, is a worse conductor than air. Good. Go that way. But what about convection? Well, for, for, a, pa for this, a pair of glass panes in a double-paned window that is orient oriented vertically, so that, the, so that this is the, the uh, orientation of the main structure, the, the convection that would occur, having picked up heat indoors on, the, on one face and trying to drop it off on outdoors on the cold face, the air becomes buoyant and rises the long way, all the way up that pair of window panes. And then it has to descend all the way down the outer window pane. So, go, so that it forms a convection cell. Convection cells are these cycles that carry heat from hot to cold, but
but the convection cell in a, in a pair of closely spaced panes, one hot, one cold, the cell it forms is this giant vertical thing. It's very inefficient. And it involves a lot of motion like this, one, one surface going up while the other portion of air, while the other portion of air is going down, and they experience viscous forces. And it basically, the convection process is very weak in that sort of pair of panes arrangement. If you turn it horizontally, it's not nearly as effective, because now you get little local cells. And that's why double pane glasses are not as good as a, you know, skylight. Skylights are not as insulating as vertical windows. It's much harder to insulate a skylight. Uh, if, you don't want it, if you don't care to be able to see through it, like, like um, if, if it doesn't have to be transparent, if it can just be translucent, then you can put fibers in there and, and pinch off convection. But otherwise, you're going to get convection. It's just the cost of doing business. So conduction's weak, poor by using the right gas. You know, you, you just do, you know. Convection's poor because it's got this giant vertical cell. What about radiation? Here's where the best advances have been made over the past couple of decades. Uh, ideally, to, to really kill off radiation, you would silver the two inside surfaces of the, of the glass and create sort of the equivalent of a, of a thermos bottle. Obviously not good for windows. Nobody wants a mirror. But, you know, if you wanted a mirror, you'd use a mirror. Okay, so, so you don't want to, to make it visibly troubled. But there are things known as heat mirrors. Um, they are coatings that are transparent in the visible, but reflective in the infrared. So they, they, they behave it's almost as perfect mirrors in the infrared, and yet you can see through them just fine. An example of that is any computer display. Those computer displays you're looking at, your, or your wa my watch, I mean, you guys are just like, probably don't even have watches anymore. But okay, you're looking through electrical conductors, because controlling the, you know, this pixel on, that pixel off. It, that takes, it's done electrically. And so there are electrical conductors all through those displays, and you are looking through those electrical conductors um, most of the time. How is that done? It turns out it is possible to make something that conducts electricity so it, that it's metallic, but it's, it's within a limited range of frequencies, which is a little bit mysterious. But it, but it works for things that, that change slowly enough, like, like real electrical switches and stuff like that. But by the time you get up to things that change very rapidly, like, like the fluctuations in a light wave of visible light, it, it, it's no longer able to handle those. It becomes non-conducting in that range and therefore becomes transparent. So you're looking through these, these transparent conductors, they're also called, uh, in all your displays. So they use, those, they use coatings of these transparent conductors on the inside surface of one of the glass windows. They don't need to do both. They can just do one of the panes. I forget whether they, whether they prefer to do the outdoor pane or the indoor pane. It probably makes a difference, but I can't think offhand why and, and, or which one they would choose. But in any case, they make it so that one pane reflects the ra thermal radiation of the other pane back at it. And that same pane that's reflective simply doesn't emit its own thermal radiation well at all. So the two panes basically cannot interact by radiation. OK? And those coatings are rather the name for them is low E, uh, low E windows. What's the E? Emissivity. The, the glass pane, one of them has very low emissivity. It's not good at interacting with thermal radiation. Uh, those coatings, well, first off, they're high tech, so they're, they, they cost money. And then second off, they, they, although they get better every year, they occasionally they go bad. Like if something gets, if, if, if the window springs a leak and something, some other gases get in there, they corrode that, that coating. And so you've, you've almost surely seen windows that have had fail, failed, the seal failed, and the window goes bad. Uh, double pane, it either turns cloudy because moisture got into it, or you start seeing colors like in the coating. The coating suddenly starts looking like oil film colors because it's, it's gone bad. It's been chemically attacked by something. Um, I guess it was, it's, it's a while back that Hereford uh, Dining Hall had, had has windows like that, and they went bad over a number of years, and so the, it, I think it was changed before you guys got here. But but those those windows are all crazy colors for for years. Okay. Any questions about that idea? Jolly, I'll stop. Enough with my harangues. All right. So on to other things. Trying to insulate stuff. Now, how about trying to work with heat? 
<clears throat> so the story of air conditioners is, is, the, is, is the introductory piece into the topic of that, that, that physicists or scientists in general would call thermodynamics. Thermo being associated with heat, and dynamics being like, like it moving around. So how do you control the flow of heat? really work with it. We've seen heat flowing, but we've sort of been passive observers of it. You make something hot, you make something cold, well, it goes from hot to cold. Wow, big surprise. Can you, can you work with it, though? Can you do something more, more sophisticated? Can you push it the wrong way, for example? What, 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 what's possible? And the answer turns out to be, yeah, you can push it the wrong way. There, there are costs to it, but you can do it. OK, so my, my opening question here is, is if you take a window air conditioning unit, so if you, surely you've seen these things, right? You, it, it's, a, it's a box you buy it at uh, some big box store. You bring it home, and you're supposed to put it in the window. You open the sash, shove it halfway out the window, whatever, close the sash, turn it on, and, and it blows cold air into the room. What if you don't put it in the window? You simply put it right on the middle of the kitchen table and plug it in and turn it on. Does the room get hotter? Colder or stay the same on average, if you, if you just average over the whole room. Okay, the question: How many think that the room will get cooler on average? How many think the room will get hotter on average? How many think that nothing much will happen on average? Okay, I I like giving away my answers these days. Temperature is going to go up. It's going to get hotter. And to give you a preview of why it's going to get hotter is that what the air conditioner does is it doesn't make the, 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 the thermal energy in the room air disappear to make it cooler. It pumps the heat. It moves the heat from where you don't want it to where you don't care. So, you, so, so it's moving heat from one place to another. And in the case of a window air conditioning unit, it moves it from the, the inside portion of the air conditioning unit to the outside portion, which, of course, if you put it on the kitchen table, is from the right side of your kitchen table to the left side of your kitchen table. And if you make one, the left side of your kitchen table, left side of your kitchen table, hot, and the right side cold, the heat's just going to flow from hot to cold and undo what you just did. But the, you know, the air conditioner's going to be busy, say, move heat from here to there, and it's going fl to flow right back the old-fashioned way. And it'll pump it again, and it'll move back. And this pumping process consumes ordered energy. You have to do work to do the pumping. And so that's why it plugs into the wall and needs electricity from the wall. It's consuming electricity to move heat from here to there, and the heat then rushes right back. It would be the same as running a, a little pump of, for water in your house, where you have a basin of water, you have a pump that lifts it up high, and then it just rolls right down some little water fountain and lands back where it started from. Nothing is happening overall, but it's consuming electricity from your wall socket and making more thermal energy as a result. OK? So bottom line is, an air conditioner plopped in the middle of your room will not cool the room. It won't even break even. It'll do worse. It'll warm the room. Same is true of, of a refrigerator, which is exactly the same as an air conditioner, except that it cools a, a confined box, having moved the heat out of the box into your room. When you open the door of the refrigerator, if you just open the door and leave it open, it's going to Re, air, heat's going to be moved around, and it's going to keep coming back to where it was, and you're going to be consuming electricity. It's just going to heat your room up again. All right? So now the point is to show you how that works. So about air conditioners. They cool the air in a room. They don't make that thermal energy disappear. They send it outside. So I, I encourage you, it's getting late in the season, but but if you've ever walked by the outside unit of an air conditioner or the, or the, the tail of the, air of the window air conditioning unit, you go near that, it's hot. That, what you're feeling is heat that was removed from the indoor air and sent to the outside unit where you're feeling it. And it, that, that, that heat that was moved is joined by heat that was created in the process of doing the pumping and that, you, that was purchased from the power company and it has been turned into thermal energy as well. So, so anyway, the outdoor units are hot. Um, they consume lots of electric power. This you will realize more when you're responsible for the bill. Uh, it's heating a house can be expensive, but cooling it can be way worse. Um, my harangue of earlier this hour is, is, uh, you know, comes to mind. So <clears throat> they're less efficient on hotter days. The bigger the temperature difference between the hot outdoor air and the cooler indoor air, 
the harder it is to keep moving the heat, to sending, keep sending it outdoors. The, the, more you, the more you pay the power company. And, yeah. It does, is this just for the wind units or, or all of them? All of them. They're all the same, in, uh, at least, certainly in concept. And in fact, in execution, they're all very similar. Um, they all, the bigger the temperature difference, the, the, the harder, the more expensive it is. For fundamental reasons, it's got, you can't beat the system. Uh, it costs you more energy, ordered energy, to, to move heat from very cold to very hot. Because that, that is what air conditioners do. At the base, most basic level is they use ordered energy to move heat the wrong way, from, from a colder object to a hotter object. That is not the way heat wants to go. It wants to go from hot to cold. It does it naturally. The other way, it does not do naturally. You have to, you have to deliberately do this. And there are, there are rules governing that pumping, the rules of thermodynamics. OK, so these are the questions. And the first one is, why doesn't heat flow naturally from cold to hot? I've, I've told you this already. Oh, it's, and we, OK. We, you've seen this question before. It showed up on the problem set. Basically, why does heat flow from hot flame? Remember the problem set? Hot flame to the cold pot. And it's not the laws of motion that, that, that govern this. It's not like the molecules can't bump, bump into each other the right way to transfer heat from the pot to the heat to the flame. The reason they don't do it is because it's statistically unlikely. It's a statistical problem. And so just be, I, I've talked about this demonstration, but I'll just do it because I can. Uh, there it is, Doc. You should be looking. Oh, where is it? There it is. OK, it showed up somewhere. OK, so what you're looking at is purple beans on one side and white beans on the other of just a glass tray. And they were arranged like this before class. And you can imagine that, that these might be the hot, hot beans, these might be cold beans, or one chemical and another chemical, or all your red socks and all your green socks. All these arrangements, these highly ordered arrangements of things, don't happen by chance. They were done deliberately. And to show you that they don't happen by chance, let me try making them happen by chance. First off, I'll, I'll take away the divider, and I will just, without looking, so I'm not cheating, right, I will stir the beans. If I can find them, okay? <laughs> i got to look to find them. Okay, stir, stir, stir. And maybe by chance, they are now perfectly separate, all the purple ones here, all the white ones there. Nope, I failed, right? So I'll try again. I won't look. Stir, stir, stir. OK. I still failed. You can imagine I could be here for a long time. I mean, it might be more fun than having to listen to me say some stuff. But, or, or maybe not. Right? You let, me be, let me stay here and do that by myself. Um, the point is, the laws of motion don't forbid that resegregation of the beans, all, purp all, all, all purple on one side, all the whites on the other. It, that's not forbidden by, by any laws of motion. What's preventing it? It's a statistical problem. The chances, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm exploring the range of possibilities. And there are so many more possibilities in which the beans are badly mixed than there are possibilities where all the colors are, 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 are where this is all one color and that's all color. There are only two ways in which the beans, all these beans can arrange themselves so they're all one color on one side and one color there. It's either purple at the top, in my view, or, or, or purple at the bottom, in my view. There's only two possibilities. There are, however, an astronomical. You know, Google, along with being a company, is a number. You guys know what Google is? It's 10 to the 100th power. I mean, you know, there, was, there was an era when nobody knew that. It was kind of cool. You know what Google is? Wow. OK, dead and gone. OK, but 10 to the 100th power doesn't begin to tell you how many ways the beans can be arranged where they're all ran badly mixed. So if I'm trying to find within a Google, and, or more than a Google of possibilities, the two possibilities in which all the beans, the blue beans are uh, one end or, and the white or the other, I'm never going to find them. It's just not going to happen by chance. I mean, technically you could say, yes, it's possible. But it's one of those possibilities that knit. There's no point in saying it's possible, because you're never going to find it. OK? So that, that is why heat flows from hot to cold, for example. The chances, the ways in which, if you, if you touch 
two boxes together, one of them full of hot stuff and one of them full of cold stuff, like purple beans, white beans. You touch them and let them exchange the heat randomly. What are the chances that they're going to have all hot, hot ones on this side and all the cold ones on that side? It, you're never going to find it. It's, it's, it's uh, suppressed by, by statistics alone. It's like winning the lottery a million, billion, trillion times in a row. It's hard enough to win it once. You're never going to do it. You're never going to have a streak that's a Google long. Okay? So why does heat flow from natural? Why does it flow naturally from optical? It's statistically likely, and there's a there's a whole formal apparatus to deal with that those statistics. And I'm going to give you just just the the, the the simplest approach to it. To do that, though, I have to introduce what are known as the the laws of thermodynamics. I mean, ideally, I would do these in the context of stuff the whole way, but but I'm just going to spit them out a little bit. So. The four laws of thermodynamics, they are technically they are numbered. There are four laws. I'm only going to discuss the first three. The fourth one is kind of obscure. And the first three, they're numbered. But oddly, they were, they were numbered badly. Uh, one, laws number one, two, and the three, that I, the three, which I won't discuss, were numbered first. And then somebody figured out, oh, man, we left out one that should have gone at the beginning. So we'll give it the number zero. So their laws of thermodynamics technically are known as, as 0, 1, 2, and 3, which is OK for people who do programming. 0 is kind of a good number, but, but it's awkward in, number, in counting. So people ask, like, why don't they renumber them? It's like, yeah, right. Why doesn't the US switch over to, to the metric system tomorrow? You know, it's just never going to happen. Or, or why are there 60, I was thinking this, why are there 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour? Isn't that really inconvenient? Why don't they go to 100 and 100? Is it ever going to happen? Never. Um, so, so I'll call them by what by a descriptive name rather than by their numbers. Secretly, this is zero. Okay, the law of thermal thermal equilibrium it, uh, observes that if you have three objects, let's say, and you three objects and you touch, this will be the the the, 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 the special one. If you if you touch one pair together and no heat flows, and touch another pair together and no heat flows. You know something about the, the, the remaining pair. You know that when you touch them together, no heat will flow. What that says is that if you have, so the, the, this is the, the special one. If, you, if this one is in thermal equilibrium with both of the other two objects, that is, they don't exchange heat when you touch them. They are, the, the remaining two objects are in thermal equilibrium with one another. The reason for that, that law and the way, the reason, what, it, what it gives us is that it's it me, it, it gives sense to the whole notion of temperature and thermal equilibrium. If you ended up with wacky paradoxes, like, like heat flows from, from, from A, I, these crazy objects, A to B, and from B to C, and from C to A, if heat flew around that, that circle, that would be crazy. You couldn't, run a, you couldn't have a temperature system anymore. Because you would say, this one's hotter than that one, which is hotter than that one, which is colder than that one. Ah, it's a paradox. So, so we don't have that. So fortunately, when, 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 it, when several objects are in, are in thermal equilibrium, they're all, it's all consistent. It's all self-consistent. And you could order the world according to which direction heat flows between objects, and it would be all self-consistent. Some would be hotter and would have a higher temperature than others. And the higher temperature ones would always let heat flow to the lower temperature ones, give it an opportunity. OK? So that's the law of thermal equilibrium. So it's, it's, it's pretty sensible. Uh, the second one is also pretty sensible, and also nothing s super new. It is basically the conservation of energy, but it's now conservation of energy. It, it's 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 worded for, I and if I, I can't tell you why it's worded as complicated as it is, but its observation is simple. The observation is that if you add, you can add energy to an object two ways. You can do work on it, or you can let heat flow into it. They both count. They're the same. They are both energy, and energy is conserved. The way it's written is messier. It's like the change of an object's internal energy, that is how much energy it's got, is equal to the heat that, that flows into it minus the work that comes out of it. So having the work come out of it just, just flips the sign. But it's, but it's basically, you could also think of it as the change in the, its internal energy is the heat that goes into it and the work that goes into it. They just reverse the work. 
and let it do work and, and subtracted it instead of sending it in and adding it. Is that okay? Conservation of energy. And it, the value of it, which you know, sort of lost, we, we, I take for granted, is that it observes that heat is a form of energy. This was not obvious to people 200 years ago. They weren't sure what heat was. When you, when you, when you cook something over a stove, they weren't sure that, that what was going into that stuff, into the pot over the stove, was related to the stuff that you, that you put into it by, by doing work on it, by, by mixing it, for example, or, or pushing on it as it moves. Uh, some of the proof of this came from things like experiments where they did work on fluids and watched the things get, and watched the uh, fluid get hotter. So wow, they're doing work and it's going into the thermal energy of the, of the, of the liquid. It's getting hotter. There evidently is a relationship between heat and work. And the, here's how it comes out. All right. <clears throat> now the more sophisticated one. I've got one more law of thermodynamics to bring up, and this is the one that has to do with statistics. And this one's not so obvious. And that is that if you, that if you take ordered energy, and ordered energy is energy that's equivalent to work. That's what a physicist would say. And what that means is that you can, any kind of ordered energy, you can, they're all equivalent, and you can ultimately build some apparatus that will use that energy to do work, like, like um, a weight high in the air. Has, it has energy in it in the form that's equivalent to work, because you can, you can let it go downhill and pull a, pull a cord and run a generator um, and generate electricity. Or a moving object has, has kinetic energy equivalent to work, because it can hit something and generate electricity. Or a spring that's wound could pull on a chain and generate electricity. They're all equivalent to being able to do work. Generating electricity is equivalent to, being, to doing work also, because you can run a motor that does do work with electricity. OK. So converting that lovely ordered type of energy into thermal energy is easy. It involves shattering the ordered energy into biddies, much like I shattered this beautifully ordered system of blue beans and, and white beans into a mess. That's easy. It's statistically likely. Smashing a, a, a glass bowl st is statistically likely. The reverse is statistically unlikely. Trying to convert the shattered energy, the thermal energy, back into ordered energy to do work with it, really tough, statistically unlikely, just as it's unlikely to unstir those beans or to reassemble a shattered glass bowl by hitting it again with a hammer. Laws of motion allow it. Statistics doesn't allow it, or don't allow it. Statistics plural or singular. Yeah, whatever. So statistically, disorder never becomes ordered. You can't undo the disordering process. Consequences that are. There is a quantity, a physical quantity known as entropy, which is the measure of a system's disorder. So the name entropy sounds a lot like energy, but don't confuse them. They're, they're quite different. Energy is a conserved quantity. You, once you have some, you can't, you can't destroy it. You have to give it to somebody else. Entropy is different. It's not a conserved quantity. It's a physical quantity. It has units and everything. You can measure an object's entropy just as you can measure an object's energy. But entropy is different in that not only is it not conserved, it tends to increase because it measures how much disorder something's got, which is a, also a peculiar notion. Why don't you measure how its order? Well, it turns out it's more interesting to measure how, how disordered it is. So a perfectly ordered uh, object has zero entropy in principle, exactly zero. Uh, and as you mess with it, you smash it, you heat it up, you give it thermal energy, you increase its entropy. It's got more disorder than it had before. OK? The, the details of how you measure an object's entropy, not, not part of this class. Yeah? Does a hotter or colder object have more entropy? It turns out the hotter object, everything else being equal, the hotter object has more entropy, because thermal energy is disordering. So that's, I mean, and, and that, that's where it's going to tie into our story, is any form of disorder counts in an object's entropy. Uh, smashing it into, into, into physical pieces in, in, increases its entropy, but adding thermal energy also increases its entropy. And it turns out that 
that the cold, uh, an object that is perfectly assembled and, and as cold as possible, absolute zero, in principle has no entropy, zero. Uh, as you smash it, its entropy goes up, or as you add thermal energy to it, its entropy goes up. And the thermal, as you add thermal energy, it's that first dose of thermal energy that's the most disordering. So as you keep adding thermal energy, and we'll do this next time because I'm obviously running late, as you add thermal energy, one dose after the next, and it, thermal energy is measured in joules, just like any other energy. As you add one joule, the second joule, the third joule, it's that first one that creates the most entry, the most disorder. The second one creates less. The third one creates less still. And, and my analogy for this is that, and I did this in the book, is you, you've got a, a, a garden party of, of octogenarians there having, sipping their tea, and across the street is a, is a party of rowdy uh, six-year-olds birthday party, you bring in the first little kid into that tea party, total mess, you know, it really cranks up the disorder. The second kid over, not so much. Third kid, not so much. Okay? So increasing, as with that temperature increases, the cost of adding more thermal energy, uh, the increase in the energy becomes less and less. Well, okay, that's good enough. I'll leave it at that and we'll, we'll pick it up on Monday. <laughs>